Good day, everybody. Recording. So let's start the meeting right here. Got a good number of people on board here. So please go to the working document for today, which I'm pasting. And Jose, if you can take notes again, that would be good. Uh, notes are on page number two in the working document here. So starting with intro, uh, no new developers this week. Uh, we have a few drop-offs. Look at our numbers. Um, we got a major plunge as school starts again. Take a look at that here. Um, yeah, numbers are kind of going down here, but we're trying to do something about that in terms of recruiting. We're actually going to have a special guest today. <clears throat> Connie is going to join us for a little crash course on guerrilla guerrilla recruiting such that we can build a team and just continue continue to do that. It's just a, an ongoing thing. We see, we do see that we have a huge turnover in a project. It's people come in and, and go. Now the, there's also a few people that throughout the project have been there for years, and and that's uh, believe it or not, that's that's actually the the people who have been around for years. Probably a, most of the development happens through their contributions. Um, the kind of the the more longer term people. In a, in a graph overall, there's an upward trend right now. We've got this S September little turn down here. Okay, uh, results and <clears throat> updates for this week. So in a half an hour, we're going to have Connie just join us and do the presentation on guerrilla recruiting. But for now, it's, the main thing is tractor work. Uh, so I want to update on that. So it's coming along quite beautifully, actually, the geometry is quite interesting and nice so if you take a look at that that's the latest uh, little micro track with raised loader arms so the progress to date page number five uh, that's that's what it looks like loader arms Josh has produced the geometry but it turns out the geometry fits quite well with what we want to do on page number five I drew the possibility of an extra power cube so say you've got the 16 horsepower on the tractor itself you can put another second one on for 32 horsepower we're gonna actually pull up the, the full CAD uh, master CAD so this is of course the on the tractor construction set 2017 page MasterCAD file and I'll pull that up to show some more details but yeah very ah probably want me to share the screen here so uh, let's share the screen I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tractor and, and because that's the main main field of endeavor for right now we'll talk about it for 10 minutes or so to show an update of where we are and what needs to be done still so now the file is getting a little bit heavy but also what I've tried to do is according to our workflow do the trick where if the file is getting too heavy take out parts like for example I already took out the power cube and in this version here I actually uh, inserted the full power cube back in to just to take a little picture of that um, so that I have a photo shoot for the announcement, which actually I'm aiming, well, I, I started it on Saturday, but I'm going to post that, I'm hoping today, um, just announcing the workshop October 27 through the 29, and actually because it's uh, such an ambitious build, I think we're going to extend that such that the first day, the 26th, would be basically tool training, torching, welding, etc., and the last day, We'll, we'll also extend it probably by one day. So just make it 26 through the 30 because it is a big, big deal. And we want to build not only this, but actually a larger one. So a larger one would be a, simply a widened two power cube version of this and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the design here. Uh, what you see here on the loader arms is the geometry for a Bobcat standard quick attach. That's basically how all the Bobcat implements are attached. It's missing some details. It's just a flat plate on the on the front, but it's not. Okay. Let's share it.
How about now? We got it now? Yeah. Okay, good. So on the tractor itself, you see the geometry. I pull, pull this geometry for the front attach plate off the Bobcat standard quick attach page on the wiki that's coming from a DXF file. That's the proper geometry. But the detail on the front where there's some pins to lock, lock implements in, that still needs to be done. And also on the back of it, what I want to do is also, since there's that space, some space here, I'll put on some, some of the whole tubing such that the Bobcat attach could be Bobcat plane or also our style where we can bolt things through the whole tubing. So that's kind of what it what it's uh, going to be like. Now check this out. So look at that. These are a little trick on these arms. They look good, right? But what I did there was, uh, so it's basically two flats. So talking about fabrication, it's a, just a flat and then another flat is put on the front of it and then it's closed with a piece of metal I basically did a long line on top and just extruded it towards the back, uh, a pad towards the back so you can see the, this is a pad off one of the arm faces, so that's all that is, just drew it with polyline tool. Um, but look at this, the geometry like this is, uh, let's just show that a little bit, look at this geometry on how the cylinders attach. So what we want to do here. Uh, right now I have this five two four five hole tubing piece right here and a bar this is a two inch bar to which the cylinders attach it's just laying below that so it could be welded but what I suggest here is actually we extend these up like a two hole piece up here two hole piece up here and hold that shaft through that just like what we did for the rear uh, <clears throat> attachment of the arms okay so we want to just do a little vertical this is this is tasks that people can take on but yeah we want to remove this five hole tubing piece and replace it with a couple of verticals it's going to be a better mount uh nicer mount system for the cylinders in the front uh the geometry as is looks really nice uh in fact there's hidden let, let's show the raised loader arms Look at that. Um, that's how. So there's raised arms. That's how it would look like. Um, <clears throat> but actually, the geometry turns out to be quite perfect. That's it's about a 70 degree rise. That would be for nice tipping height. Now the person, there's a person in this too. I put in. Uh, where's the person? there they are that's for reference of a six foot two meter person six foot that's that's the size reference this is a nice uh, small small compact tractor what else is to be said about this uh, I mentioned the power cube the possibility of a second power cube added um, which I just hid. Let's see if I can unhide it. Where is that thing? Put the, these things back in. That's the power cube in the back. That can be practical. Um, of course, the controls would have to be in front of that because the person typically would ride on a little platform on the back. So the person can walk behind this or ride on a little platform but if there was another small power cube that would be good idea being that this this space here has just the engine and the hydraulic pump and the reservoir plus the cooler this this power cube here would basically feed off that there would be another hose running to the hydraulic reservoir and the cooler so the cooler can be just a little bigger and then what we can do is feed off that there is one issue on this power cube regarding the engine. The engine has only two amps or so of power, uh, electrical power generation. So, like for two power cubes, there will be four amps total. 
but that's hardly enough for a nice fan like a, for a fan for cooling you'd need like 8 amps 10 amps or so so there's a little issue there on these very inexpensive engines which are $229 for 16 horsepower um, idea being what are we gonna do for cooling it's it's not good I mean the only thing we can do right now is put on a solar panel I mean that's that's what we're planning to do that's what we're actually gonna do with the people in um, in Utah where we got the brick press because we got the same engine I mean we need power for the cooler and and for the CB press controller so what to do a solar panel is one answer but that's more parts and everything not a preferable thing but we just don't have the charging power now we could go to other engines and so forth but uh, we just can't get I mean this this engine that we use right now we probably would end up paying 50 percent to 100 percent more for something that's got enough charging power I mean 229 dollars I mean that's just ridiculous cheap which allows us to do this very inexpensively for a lot of power but uh, <clears throat> at that point it makes sense just to put on a solar panel to make up for that little uh, lack so the solar panel could be as small as pretty much like the top of this it could pretty much fit on top of this power cube here so not a big deal what else here if we extend this lengthwise you see like how the track is long here like the span between these two idlers is pretty long the, that means the track will wobble up and down here typically they have a the industry standard is you put a bunch of little idlers here so that the that the the tracks stay on the ground pretty well we haven't done that in uh, the micro track or the, the rather the yeah the tractors from 2015 2016 they still work well have an incredible traction I mean I, as, as I said this here has 7,000 pounds of of uh, pull force using these 45.6 cubic inch hydraulic motors very powerful 15,000 inch pound hydraulic motors sorry about the non-metric but um, the Toro Dingo for comparison has a 32 cubic inch hydraulic motor and because of its sprocket geometry it would have um, instead of 7,000 pounds like of pulling torque like we have here it has 4,000 I think it has 4,000 now I'm not sure because I'm not sure exactly what kind of motor they're using I couldn't find the specs on it outside of it being a 32.3 cubic inch motor but it depends what the internals of the motor are for how much torque it is but at their best case they've got 4,000 pounds of push we have 7,000 which in both cases is a lot um, but we're better than that uh, the price I was going through the numbers here and the total price on this thing include I mean the whole thing two power cubes so you're talking about this loader everything about I counted forty three hundred dollars in a quick calculation so compare that to thirty thousand dollars for a 25 horsepower Toro Dingo and here we have 32 horsepower so we're gonna gobble them up the uh, point is that low cost by open source design here can get you far now of course we have to work out all the details like if this is the first prototype of this style I mean which is overall our 11th tractor that we're building uh, then of course there's gonna be some things to work out and that's why we can do a lot in the CAD making sure like little tricks you gotta watch out for okay can you fit the bolts and you know like we've got bolts in, in these these here we've got bolts you know underneath wherever like here uh, on idler plates everything has to fit uh, all the geometry is needs to happen like here we're missing details like you know our our idler mount uh, motor mount plates they're still we got to correct those the exact geometry of the hydraulic motor has to be put in you got to put in all the details like the you know say the fittings on top uh, if the fittings are on top, then you can't put the power cube on top, so you got to make it go backwards, so it's pointing backwards. Uh, if it's pointing backwards, it's pointing straight at the operator, so you got to make sure there's no conflict there. So you just got to think about all the geometry. Uh, there's clamps that go on this, so this, so your loader arms don't slip off. There's got to be clamps on the main shaft here, so the shaft doesn't move back and forth. 
power cube has to be bolted to the base. Uh, we might, if we use a longer base version of this, we might add a third idler. Uh, if this here, as I, I looked at it, it's actually right now, it's 40 inches. between the wheelbase uh, it's showing me 39 yeah it's 40 inches in the wheelbase so last year actually we did 32 inches so this is a little longer we, if we go longer than this for the bigger tractor we probably want to add a third idler in the position so that's kind of how it looks as far as the loader arms you want to trim up the geometry net right now there's this nice smooth kind of a shape well um, <clears throat> what we want to do is have it thicker at the middle and thinner at the ends or nah, or where it's no you got to change the geometry a little bit you can you can fatten it up here a little bit because there's that mount point that there's a lot of force there so just just going through that and trimming it up to make it not um, round like this but a little more appropriate for material use like for example it's not you don't need this to be so fat right here it can be a little more narrow. Typically, loader arms are thicker in the middle, or actually thicker where they attach. So just just little geometry geometry considerations. That's actually where some finite element analysis from within FreeCAD could be good. That's that would be quite useful there to do that. Maybe we could add that to our capacity. Maybe we can uh, talk to some of the people who are doing the finite element analysis. The basically the CAE analysis which FreeCAD is is pretty much set up for pretty well so that's good okay so that's that's the tractor so next steps next steps we want to go with uh, let's write it down actually on what are the next steps real quick so here's a couple of pictures next steps I'm gonna go into the slide and say <clears throat> so number one would be the two power cube wide version tractor not micro tractor uh, of course we got to finish this up so finish details on micro track two power cube wide version of the bigger one uh, the bigger one is gonna have a cab on big tractor The big one what else we're gonna have to create an attachment if so if we combine so I what I like to do is have a big one that's slightly longer so big big tractor is slightly longer is longer because the cab has to go on it the loader arm geometry would be probably different because we're not we want now some real serious high reach probably mount that those loader arms on the cab so bigger you know bigger loader arms And if we can put two power cubes on it, there might be considerations for uh, not only two, but four power cubes. Just like here, we have the consideration for not only one, but two power cubes on a micro track. As far as the tracks themselves, they can be pretty much identical. Here we have nine, nine inch wide tracks. They're pretty decent for decent size. Uh, idlers could be the same frame is the same 4x4 tubing uh, Bobcat quick attach so here is um, and this one is the official Bobcat quick attach kind of a structure uh, without the detail but but it's the Bobcat quick attach its base is 40 like 42 inches which is just the width of our tractor so we can possibly use it in other words, you can put any Bobcat implement onto this device, uh, which is great. So we can put on put on our own implements. We can make Bobcat quick attach mounts for our implements, or as I mentioned, put on the box tubing on the back of this. So you also have like put a few holes in here, so you can also bolt things on as needed for some simple things. And bolting, of course, is not convenient. The convenience about the Bobcat standard is you just pull two pins, two levers and then your implement comes off. It's very easy to put things on and off, which is what you want to do if you have a lot of different implements that you want to work with. Uh, more about the future work here. So 
um, some of the key implements. So a bucket. Uh, so on Microtrack, more implements. So bucket, a brush hog or mower. Tiller. <clears throat> Those are some key implements that we want like right now. If we get fancy, we can do backhoe. Now, if we have any of this stuff, like I was, I said, I'm leaving the third day, the fourth day in a in a build workshop. I'm thinking in that fourth day, we're gonna build some implements. So, however much design we have, we're gonna do it. I, I'm hoping we can do the backhoe, and also I'm hoping that the torch table is in operation that we're using our own torch table, so we can do it very easily. So we can dedicate the first day for some not only <clears throat> tool training but also CAD training, and that's that's the way we're looking at it right now. Uh, get pretty much ready for like a little developer's crash course during this tractor build. You're learning both the CAD and the, and the physical tools for building. So if there's if we just get enough people and someone gets excited to uh, design more, then that's good. And this is also an opportunity for people to join a dev team. Uh, because they see a real case of a build. So those are the implements. The backhoe is uh, hopeful, but definitely, absolutely, definitely bucket, brush hog. I mean, brush hog is just a blade. Uh, we did a supersized string trimmer a long time ago. Um, I should show you that. If you haven't seen this video, take, take a look at that, because uh, that's what we want to do again. Of course, with a more proper version, string trimmer. OSC does that come up yeah strings attached open source string trimmer uh, take a look at that if you want for uh, a video on Vimeo I'll put that into the into a link there but it's a very simple thing. It's a what we did there was a chain mounted. Well, it was chain mounted on a. Where is that thing? Somewhere back here. It's not giving a direct link. It's an old video from a long time ago. Uh, so if you go back in the history. But the idea is a, a chain. Chain chain works really well for a brush cutter. So you can do that. Uh, we can do a very simple one like that. Tiller is. Uh, powered tiller so you got hydraulic motor on the tiller and a backhoe so tiller probably like a counter rotating one where you got two blades that rotate counter each other that would be the optimal thing to do um any details there or you can just have a simple blade just a single blade if you do the counter rotating you need like two motors or some way to get two two drive shafts going backhoe is of course a very useful implement Okay, uh, more on the large tractor. Uh, we gotta get it started, and for this Saturday, I'd like to post. So I'm, you know, I'm posting the announcement today, and by Saturday, I want to update the announcement with the bigger tractor version. So because we're promising that we'll build both of them, and and they're largely the same design, except of course geometry is different so if we have a large number of people that can all be parallel we can all be working on a different parts the power cubes tracks everything everything is a module so it's clear how it fits together all right so let's keep moving on um, let's see do we have um, Connie did you join us yet did Connie join us yet so we're getting ready Uh, Connie, are you on? We can't hear you if you are. But uh, guys, please let me know if Connie, if we see Connie, so we can have her take the floor for a little bit here. Okay, but moving on here. <laughs> here's another cool thing. So, Brad Collette lives in Missouri. He's the one of the developers of the Path Workbench. So there's a very clear tool chain now that we have for generating the CAM files, meaning G code, G code export, meaning the cutting file. Uh, how you actually what what information you send to the CNC torch table 
for it to be able to cut. So that's in there. That's in the FreeCAD Path Workbench. Check it out. So uh, if you download the Path Workbench, I think you have to download it. I don't think it comes stock with FreeCAD. Um, and Christian, if that's that, we were going to have to add that to our OSC Linux. If we look at OSC Linux, I don't think we have Path Workbench in there yet, but it's it's totally ready for pl prime time. It can do exactly what we need to generate the G-code, which is a great, great simplification. Because before, uh, in 2011, when I did some cutting here for the tractor production run, we, where we built four tractors back a long time ago, I used a, an external application called DXF to G-code. It takes DXF files, it generates toolpath files for the CNC torch table in the form of G-code. Uh, but now that's in FreeCAD, so there we go. Uh, case solved and let's see do we have our in our table of different things in our list of the software yeah we don't have that there yet we got to add that path workbench to our OSC Linux distribution so that's more work for Christian all right uh, so check it out check out this workflow see if it works for you this is these are the instructions very simple step by step from Brad and uh, should be good to go we'll have to try it out all right next so FreeCAD workbench programming this is great stuff so so Steven's doing great work on he started the the 3d printer design workbench in FreeCAD and for that He's basically going into FreeCAD and exploring its whole structure and then programming a workbench. So how do you do that? Well, we're going to learn that. Um, we're learning that with Steven. Uh, Steven, let's see, do you want to uh, start on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the, probably the best resource right now is, is this video, that instructional that I made. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it covers basically everything that I've listed here. Okay. Uh, it's, basically, it's basically like a summary of like uh, everything I learned this past weekend, like how to how to get around. Like. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, Stephen. Uh, sorry, sorry to cut you off here, but I just saw that Connie joined us here. So let's have her. Let's give the floor to her for now, and then we'll come right back to you. What we want to do right now is a quick, quick intro of guerrilla marketing. So Connie, can you hear us? Can you? Um, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So that's excellent. So, so we want to welcome Connie. Now, um, what? So Connie is. Um, I met her through. So this is a connection through actually the Ted Fellows program. Actually, uh, got connected through uh, one of the facilitators of the Ted program, and and Connie's coaching me in particular on the building of an HR team so so recruiting is a big part of a project like this we have huge social capital and, and there's so many people that want to contribute but then you have to get them on and, and make sure that they perform and that uh, we build a significant team so the grand goal is just like linux.org they've got 4,000 yearly developers every year contributing like a billion dollars worth of software contributions uh, I'd like to see OSE get there in a decade. That's how long it took the Linux project to get there, to that kind of level of, of performance. So today we're going to just hear basics on what, um, just, just guerrilla marketing. How can we as the team members, which, which we're the true believers here, we're actually doing this. How can we invite more people? How can we make it easy? How can we facilitate this uh, invitation process so we, we can all recruit and invite others to the program? Uh, we're going to talk about that. So Connie uh, shared a link. Connie, do you want to do you want to just share your screen, or should we just go into the document? Um, I, I think I can share my uh, screen. You'll have to bear with me, my friend. Uh, this is my first encounter with this um, Jitsi. Yeah. So, um, I'll just apologize in advance if I mess this. No, up. no problem. <laughs> uh, can you show your screen so we see I, who I, you are? There's on top there's a start stop camera. Okay. Permission denied. Okay. Um, Permission denied. Um, maybe you just um, refresh yours. I don't know. See if you can just refresh your browser and see if that works. If not, we'll just go right on. Okay. Sorry. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm still getting a... Okay. For anyone who wants to see Connie, we've got her video. She, she's got Connie Log. Oh, are we there? No. Okay, she's sharing her screen. Um, oh my God, am I live? <laughs> no, you're not. We can't see you. I think we um, we saw your screen. So let's see. Go back to the, what you just did. Oh yeah, there you go. Okay, so we've got uh, Connie sharing her screen. So let's just uh, take a look at that. If you're curious to see the meeting with, between Connie and myself, that's on her log. You can view it, what we talked about in terms of HR issues and recruiting. So, And, and by the way, uh, Joseph left the team, so we really don't have anybody doing this function right now. That's why our first priority is going to be to find somebody to be the HR generalist for the team, just to do the recruiting, follow up with people, get people on board, and etc. Okay, Connie, take it away, please. Okay, thanks. It is a pleasure to meet all of you, and um, I'm going to take some of the pressure off of myself and really treat this like a just a dialogue and a conversation, so it's not so mechanical. Yeah. But any while I'm I'm talking, you can interject and we can discuss, um, and I certainly encourage that, and I'll ask you questions as we yeah. go along to try and keep you all engaged. So. Um, First, you know, I'm just coming up with a little tagline that we're going to find, we're going to engage, and we are going to recruit. So, um, with that, I want to pop up a slide. So, after today, if any of you want to contact me individually or set up a, a side conversation on more uh, how-to type information, this is me. So, you can, you can go back to this whenever you'd like. Uh, my email, my LinkedIn. Um, my Instagram, yeah, for sure, I am. I am Connie Poppin Bottles. So there's a story behind that I'll share with you someday when we're friends. Um, yeah, that was a joke. Okay. Is going to be a tough crowd? No? No, no, we're, no, we're, we're really good. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's get started. So overall, I'd like to kind of quick go over what our mission is. Um, and I came up with kind of a mission statement that is a work in progress, so any of you want to add to that, we can. But sometimes it's good just to have a mantra to keep us going. Um, then I'll cover why this can work, how we're going to get how we're going to get them, um, meaning um, contributors. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how to get tactical, and then go further into online recruiting using Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and then we'll cover kind of the next steps. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, so the, the mission statement that I came up um, is to find collaborator, collaborators with heart and passion who will share our vision of bringing about a new world for open source ethic of collaborative development and, and accessibility. I totally plagiarized there. I stole a lot of words off of your website, so um, but I think it kind of encompasses some of the stuff that we want to do. So when you think about... This sounds good to me. Yeah, I think that's that's I think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> so, you know, when we think about recruiting, um, it's just like marketing. We're, we're marketing a brand. We're marketing, you know, the, the cause, and with uh, with that goes along some, some highlights. And that's really when you um, think about online marketing, online recruiting. Um, we have to be um, specific to the communities that we're reaching out to or to the audiences that we want to connect with or touch. Um, there's a lot of planning and acting strategically and dynamically. This is not a static process. Um, we use a variety of online tools frequently and regularly. This is not something that you can just push and walk away, push and walk away. It's really about an engagement process. Um, and this isn't just involving just one person or a couple of people. This is this is a group effort. All all hands on deck. All hands on deck, and all everyone should be able to participate. Um, and then um, we need to measure our outcomes, not just the output. So you know, what are you doing on a weekly basis? What what kind of traction is that getting us? And with that, we have to be ready to make changes to continually evolve the process and our approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, you know, also to keep in mind, you know, recruiting is 
um, again, like marketing, we're marketing a brand. So any company, organization, function, it all, it all comes down to, to, to a, a form of, of branding. And that'll make a little more sense as I, I go along as, as we talk about how we get our messages out there. All right. So mm -hmm. um, here's some fun facts. So some stats, because um, you think about recruiting and finding volunteers out there in the world, it's like, oh, it's daunting. But really, in actuality, in, in accordance to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, in 2016, there were 62.6 .6 million volunteers just in the United States. And, you know, what I like to say, in essence, contributing is like volunteering. There are people out there willing to give their time for, for a cause that's close to them or, or affects them or affects somebody else that they know. Um, and then the, the median average was about 94 hours. Um, and I think some of the, the math that Martin did was um, six, billion, 6 billion hours annually, thus an annual potential for OSC, about 50 million OSC developers. And we, we, we need only 4,000 within the next decade. So that's, I don't know, I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And the math is really impressive. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean... That's amazing. It's like 94 hours per average person in the United States for those 62 million people. It's that's just amazing. There's a lot of effort we can tap. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, let's kind of get into the, the the why. Why people want to 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 join this team um, and be contributors. And I kind of and and. and I'm very contextual, so I want to kind of build a little bit of a foundation as we move on. Um, and so you think about a person's values and, and, and uh, it, it cause aligns with someone's values and they want to understand the world around them. And when I say that, um, humans usually, they want to do what's right. They want to participate in things that align with, again, their values, their belief systems, and Many of us want to understand through learning and getting involved so they have a better insight to a problem or a cause. And the next part is, you know, feeling better about themselves. You know, it's, again, another human function. They want to feel, we want to feel like we're making a difference in the world and we're not just existing to the, the end of our heartbeat, so to speak. Um, and there's always a, a constant sense of feeling of, of needing to belong and adding a sense of value. I don't know if, if you, many of you are, are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, yeah. but a, a lot of that plays into that. Um, so if, if you don't know about um, Maslow, Google it. It's pretty interesting, uh, an interesting concept. And then um, personal development. You know, for our, our learners and achievers out there in the world, they want to continue to grow and they want to participate in that contribute to their own development. And I call that the with them. What's in it for me? Um, and also concerns for their community. Um, individual care where they live, they breathe, their children live, breathe, family, friends, um, so on. Um, there's an attachment or a responsibility to what happens in their community. So the more that we can tell the story about what we're doing, or what OSC is doing, um, and how it impacts them, um, it's a, it's a powerful connect. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit uh, context on the on the why. So I'm going to move on to um, how how are we going to get contributors? And you're, there's three overarching pieces I want to cover. I mean, we could go on and on, but three that that, that speaks to me um, is tapping into someone's heart and passion. So we're out there and we're seeking individuals that want to contribute. Um, uh, because it, 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 it touches them. There's, you know, they, they, they're like-minded folks like us, and um, it, it's, you know, what, what we're doing is, is near and dear to their, to their hearts. Um, let's see, and, uh, sorry, I lost my thought here on my notes. Um, and, you know, as we, as we weave our messages and our communications, you know, tapping into somebody's heart and passion is the, the, the connect and the contact that you're going to make with these individuals. Um, and these individuals 
have a care for, for what you're doing and what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. Next is the compelling message. Um, you know, we get contributors, contributors, contributors by what we're saying and, and what we're telling. Um, and so it's kind of like a pitch. It's almost like a sales pitch. In, in, some, in some ways it will be, but it's giving a short and simple direct message communicating um, the need for contributors and the good he or she can do. Again, it's that connect back to them personally, what, what impact he or she can have. Um, so I, I kind of fumbled through making up my own message of what would be a compelling message I might reach out to somebody that I've made a connection with. Um, and I'll just treat you like story time right now and I'll just kind of read it. So if I were to post, you know, what would the world be like if everyone had the opportunity and access to a set of the 50 most important machines that it takes for modern life to exist? Everything from a tractor to an oven to a circuit maker. That means no more dependency on corporate entities to control the accessibility to these items. We at OSE are driving our vision to make this possible. If you care about freedom, equal distribution, and the evolution of the human race, we are looking for contributors like you. Learn more at, and there's a link, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, how we embed those in our messages, um, and our need for contributors at, and then it'll be another hyperlink that we can go and actually express, upload their resume, and so on and so forth. How am I doing? Good, good. And so is this like the message that that that's what you, where we're at right now are we going to have like a number of messages like this because i know this message could appeal to some people maybe some other people want to hear something a little different absolutely that's a very good point um what i'll be working on over the next couple of days will be almost like a, a cheat sheet or a quick hit of different things that we can pull but this is also a collaboration so these pe people out there in the, in the in the industry and the networks um, you're going to know them better than I, so you're going to know how what what messaging will work best for them. Think of this more of kind of a, a framework. Um, if one wants to create their own messaging, I, I, like you're saying, like some people might care about you know the 50 most important machines. Some people might be more interested in you know building the house or the hydroponics or or so on and so forth. Yeah. But as you, yeah and how so the main question is okay how do we make this user friendly that we have it accessible like is this going to be like a page on the wiki where we say this is our hr kit or something like that um how do we make it easy for people to pull off it and use it yeah uh, understood so at the end of this at the end of the the, the slides here um, i have on our next steps and that's okay uh, one of the points creating uh, an HR weekly blast email onto the group where I can copy and paste, um, you know, a, an amount of, of canned messaging. Um, we can also, um, of course, put it on um, the wiki page where people can just go and pick it up. Um, those, those are the thought processes, but exactly, there will be like a, an, an HR toolkit where you can, can go. I, I, really like the idea of a central depository because you know I, I'm certainly not going to think of everything um, so it's a great place where people could drop messages and, and what they've used and people can kind of massage it from there yeah 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 it would be good to like you know like for automated marketing like for example on on Facebook you can schedule messages it would be nice to actually have you know, like the professional marketers, they do that. They schedule out their thing like for the whole year. They just, okay, pre-program it and it just goes out all the time. I think we, we could probably maybe frame it with respect to that so we have a bunch of messages, but then we also attach a schedule to it like, okay, every single week from now till eternity, we're going to send out like one message about recruiting and we can maybe think about programming that and using a cap capacity like Facebook to schedule messages like that because i think people have to hear this on a continuous basis to know that yeah that's still valid we're still looking for people uh we can automate that so we'll see how we can um make that happen with the resources that we have i guess yeah, i look forward to brainstorming some ideas certainly there's a, a way to kind of hit cruise control on some of the stuff um and that just it, it helps with 
you know, people's lifestyles. They don't have to stop everything that they're doing to pose a, a message. To, to right. Automated something that happens for sure. Yeah. All right. And uh, moving on. So the, the next was uh, more of a, a personal approach tactic. Um, and again, it, it plays back to individuals um, that want to feel valued. And so this takes a little more, a little more time and a little more effort. And this is really getting to know like a potential contributor um, and really understanding what their strengths and their skills are. There's obviously you're connecting with this person on a, a on a more um, lack of vernacular, deeper level because they have something that would be of value um, and a great assist to OSE. So understanding people's potentials and then as you're, you know, engaging in a, a thread of conversation with them, you're highlighting how they could um, contribute in the project and, you know, what those those skills that that person has, again, on, on what a difference it could make to the cause or to the, you know, to the vision. Um, so, again, personal approaches um, are, are, are much more targeted. I'll, I'll say it like that. So um, that might make a little more sense as we get through this and we, we get a little further on um, on how that will, will come into play when you make a, a connection with a particular person. Yeah. All right. So um, let's get a little more um, practical. And this might be a little... I, I, might be a little repetitive of what I've said previously, but getting tactical means focusing on the conversation. And co conversing online um, can be like speaking to somebody in person. Um, however, you've got to kind of think about that attention span of somebody with so much, you know, stimuli and data and everything coming at an individual for them to stop and read your messaging. Um, you know, nobody wants to spend minutes reading a dissertation or a you know a book or a novel so think about um, you know the standard terminology is the 30 second elevator pitch and that's really um, who you are what you're representing why you're contacting them and you know how they can help and again this um, uh, it, it, it's a little bit crucial um, people again people get messages and spammed and everything else so much, so um, it's, uh, it's, it's relevant to see who, what, why, how in the back of your mind. Um, again, using the personal approach in your conversations, and again, that's just tying back, you know, that person's um, skill set values that, that connects with OSE. Um, and then again, you know, it's you, it's, it's your own passion. Why are you involved in OSC? Um, and use your own passions and intellect to explain, you know, what you're working on or, or what the project means to you or what it means to you. Um, it, again, it's, it's, it's having a conversation with another human. You know, you know, you're doing this all, you know, digitally. It's just pretend that they're standing right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, and then recruitment message, again, short, simple, and direct. Um, and again, reiterating, communicate the need contributors and, and tie in that with them, um, the good that he and she can do and, and, you know, what they can get out of it. All right. How's everybody doing? Are we all right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think this is good. Let's keep going. Okay. Great. Uh, continuing with getting tactical, um, there's, there's a couple overarching themes. One is targeted recruiting. Um, targeting, re targeted, target recruiting um, is, Definitely LinkedIn. It's the power of networking. Um, can I ask the question? Can people respond or can I get a feel? How many people, um, how many of the team is already on LinkedIn? I'm in there. Um, people, um, yeah, write the text or you can speak up. Sometimes, I mean, I think everyone's muted, so a lot of times um, okay. people don't respond as readily okay no worries no worries I'll, I'll keep going but um, you can see the text two people said they are one person said they're not three people on one not okay 
Seventy-five percent of us are on. Eighty percent. All right. All right. That's, that's outstanding. That's outstanding. Okay, so um, then many of you know the power of networking, and that's these, you know, these clusters and communities of, of people that you've connected with. Um, so I mean, that's that's half the battle is is um, making those connections, and then you can hone in on those individuals. I've got some examples coming up. Um, on some targeting that I did, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment. And again, targeting recruiting can encompass social media in general. I mean, you can target anybody um, through your Instagram, through Facebook, through any of the platforms. It's, again, it's just getting to know who you're talking to. In, the next one is the concentric circles recruitment. I know it's jargon, the fancy fancy word. Um, and basically, it's about don't forget about your maybe your current clients that you have in your your nine to five world, your family, your alumni from you know your schooling, in, in, uh, your professional networks, um, individuals that you may know or know of that have been affected by any of the problems that OSC is, is working on or um, trying to solve or you know something that would impact change. Um, Never forget what could be right in front of you. The next would be um, power of association. Um, the power of association is again when you're speaking to you know people out there in the world. Um, it's it's how you project your moments and your experiences on the things that you're working with. If that means you know I just spent the last two hours hunched over. Uh, a, a cat drawing for the geometry of XYZ, you know, just you make it make it real. And you could to other people that work with the CAD system and, and they can be like, oh brother, I, I know you I know the grind. I know how you're feeling. Again, it's it's the association you're making with people and sharing things that they can relate to. And that's that's that includes your triumphs, that includes your challenges, you know, things that, oh we thought it would go this way and, and it's Know, hashtag fail. You know, this is what I'm feeling, and this is what we're going through. What are your guys' thoughts? You know, again, the power of association. All right, let's switch gears. Now we're gonna, now we're going to get in it a little bit more. Um, I already asked the question about um, how how many of you are on uh, LinkedIn. Can I get a little bit of a chime on on Instagram? Um, because I'm not 100% not... clear on the demographic on the on the core team. Sometimes um, that influences who's on Instagram and who's not. Yeah. No, I I don't don't do that. <laughs> no, Josh. Well, you gotta, it's gonna be magical. You'll love it. <laughs> oh yeah. It's better than Facebook. It, well, it's it's certainly uh, it's certainly I would say more instant. Than Facebook, but the great thing is that with these social media platforms, they're so integrated. You push to Instagram, you can click and push to Facebook, or vice versa. Uh, so they, they're kind of all inter, interwoven. Wow. Nobody right. on our team. There's five people responded. None of the five that responded are on <laughs> are on Instagram. Don't be afraid of the selfie. It's fine. No, it's I fine. I love that, but. Yes, just haven't ever gotten into it. Yeah. I know, I know. You know, it's uh I, I have Instagram also and you know, I, I fell off the grid for a little bit, you know, in my past life working in nightlife and hospitality industry, I was on it all the time telling stories and staying connected. Um but, you know, it's it's it, it can be um you know, it has to be a constant in your life to keep it up. Um and I don't know. It, it's not that difficult, but for our purposes for recruiting, you know, for Instagram being, you know, once or twice a week, um, it's just it's really instant storytelling, instant visual yeah. stories of what's happening with you right then and there. Um, so it, it it'll it'll be it'll, it'll be fun. It'll be fine. All right. So uh, let me give just an overarching. Um, a little bit so like I said there's influence visual storytelling 
Um, and then here's some fun facts. So across the globe, there are over 700 million Instagrammers. More than 300 million use Instagram every day, sharing on an average of 35 million photos and videos per day. Again, that's that's impactful. That's a lot of a lot of voyeurs, right? A lot of people looking in. Um, so when you think about um, Instagram or social media in general and recruiting, um, it, it was pretty it was pretty untapped. Um, but of course, over the last five to eight years, um, it's it started changing. It's, it's it's like a must in companies, organizations, uh, mm. anybody that has a a cause or a message. Um, you know, and and of course, the the reach because of the reach of social media, um, it's it's long surpassed you know any type of print communication, um, and it gives us the ability to converse more, share, get information almost instantaneously, um, and again, it's optimal. It's an optimal reach for uh, re recruitment. Um, so we're gonna. Um, over the next few slides, we're going to review Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, you know, I thought about putting in uh, Facebook and Snapchat, um, but this call would, it would go on forever. So, you know, mm -hmm. if, if there's interest, we can, we can do another session on those two other platforms. Um, all right. So, you know, this this particular photo here, um, Martin, is that you? Yeah. Have you been over the okay. Yeah, that's me there. So, <laughs> you're famous. All right, so I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not 100 percent sure who um, designed, build. Yeah, that's the people we built the brick press for. That they're doing um, basically uh, sustainable construction projects at the University of Utah. So they they build houses for like low income people. Actually, they work on the native reservations. So we we built the brick press for them. They're going to use that next year. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, the 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 jewel about this particular their Instagram account um, as I went into theirs and started looking at their messaging you know they're talking about OSB quite a bit in many posts mm -hmm. uh, there's there's an opportunity there you know there's a reach those people that those that follow um, this particular account um, is just another layer of people that OSE the, the team can be talking to yeah so it's just it goes on and on and on you know, and when somebody shouts out and does something like this, it's almost it's like good manners um, that you're going to respond to it and you're going to repost this to your your follow followers. So it yeah. goes on and on and on. So again, opportunity constantly there. Um, okay. So okay, another fun fact. How you're loving my fun facts? So let's talk about millennials. Um, that seems to be a hot topic because they are the next generation of the up and coming moving into the workforce and whatnot. Uh, millennials are visually driven, they're constantly connected, and want to find personal meaning in their work. And when I say constantly connected, I don't know if you, if, you know, when you go to the grocery, the supermarket, the marche, um, shop, wherever you go, um, and you look around and, it, you know, get judgy, and you can see the millennials. I mean, their faces are buried in their telephones, right? So they're, it's just that constant connected, constantly texting, Instagramming, Facebooking, wanting to know what's going on. Um, so 59% of them are active users on Instagram. Um, and again, millennials use this. They're searching for jobs, and they want an inside view of a company's culture, um, and they want to read more about it. Um, you know, it's uh, again, uh, so it's. You know, it can be a, a powerful tool um, where somebody can't just come to Missouri and take a walk around the shop to look. So, so they, they get a sneak peek. Again, I, I, I say voyeur. Um, sometimes it feels like that. But um, anyway, so I'm going to um, move on to the next slide, if I may. 59% mm -hmm. yeah. of them are active on Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's you know I, I don't know what the math is, but that's that's a lot, right? Yep. <laughs> um, okay, so again, so Instagram users want to, and this isn't just millennials, this is anybody. Instagram users want to see the unseen what's into the world they would otherwise have no access to. So again, you're telling a story. It's usually telling stories about you know what's going on. Um, 
there at OSC and in the moment, you know, just, yeah, just seeing somebody hunched over, a, you know, building or, or hauling or, you know, or if it's sitting at the computer and, and you're working on a, a, a design, you know, that people, it resonates with people. Um, so that, that kind of covers that, that second bullet point too. Um, and then I wanted to point out, um, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. Um, it's about connecting with humans, not machines, so treat it as such. So it's, again, there's a little genes de foi when you're, when you're, when you're doing this. It's, it's, and I'm not talking about grammar or, or things like that. It's just be clear on your messaging on, on you know, what you're doing, what you're feeling, and you know, what's happening. You are talking to, to humans out there. Um, and then another thing I threw in here, I just wanted to make sure that I covered, you know, when you start these, you start having followers or you're following other people and you're, you're reading these stories and seeing these stories and, and whatnot. And when people talk to you, you got to, again, this is all about a constant conversation and involvement. So you've got to um, reply promptly, um, give, you know, complete information. And if somebody says something that's not so awesome about what you're doing or your thoughts, um, it's it's not a grounds for for throwing the gloves off. You know, it's not about being defensive. It's about being open to that feedback. You know, again, um, dropping the ego, dropping the insecurity, so on and so forth. All right, mm -hmm. how y'all doing? Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Let's do it. So uh, the next few slides is really talking about how to set up your account. Um, this, is, this was uh, kind of hard for me to, to capture um, without doing like a 36 slide presentation on just building accounts. So what, an account. So what I did was kind of do a, a, a 45,000, 35,000 foot view, and then I've included in how to links um, to build out an account, and also again offering. Um, another time where we could get together and share screens and I can actually assist you if you wanted some hands-on help um, building out uh, an account. So when you set up a, an Instagram account, it's about building trust. Um, let people know who you are and be yourself um, and share and capture things, um, you know, that, that, that in your moment um, and keep it personal and it's, you know, it's, it's person to person. Um, like Twitter, Instagram is really about um, becoming known, trusted, and liked. Um, this is not a, 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 a broadcast medium for spamming jobs. This, that's not what this is necessarily about. It's really about getting to know the people that you follow and that are following you and engage them just like you would in having a cup of coffee or something or, or a cocktail or a beer. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at this particular example that I pulled um, just off the internet, um, you'll see, uh, I don't know who this guy is. So this is a recruiter's in Instagram. Um, you know, his photo, he's cheery and, and recognizable. Um, always make sure you fill out your bio so people know who they're, they're talking to. It takes a hot second, but, but do it because, again, you're personalizing this platform for people to engage with you. And then you'll see that, you know, this particular recruiter, you can see how many posts they've done, how many followers, and how many people they're following. You know, a general rule of thumb, unless it's, um, you know, somebody's doing guerrilla marketing out there or something inappropriate, anybody that follows you, you probably want to follow back. Um, but, but again, it, you know, people, there are people out there that are using Instagram for I'll just say inappropriate, inappropriate things, um, and and some you know some awkward sales stuff. But you, you don't have to follow them, even though they're following you. So keep that in mind. Uh, you're still empowered. Uh, on the next slide, this is a this came off of Dave Hackens. Uh, yeah, Dave. Is Dave still on the team? No, he's a he's a different project it's called precious plastic like uh okay. open source recycling machines for plastic and stuff okay. mm -hmm. so great so this is this is a great
great example of that, you know, Dave took the time to share, again, Martin, uh, aquaponics greenhouse, you know, so he's telling a story, and again, this is another opportunity, um, you know, he's, he's sharing the story, putting your name out there by using, um, let's see here, the um, hashtag, and hashtags are used in Instagram just like they are in Twitter. Um, they help people find content, people, and accounts to follow. So any, so you'll see like hashtag open source ecology. Somebody you know clicks on that, they're going to be able to get connected to OSC's Instagram page. Um, then moving on, um, you'll see that he has like an at symbol in somebody's name. This is like um, I don't know, kind of like a in Facebook, like when you poke somebody, um, you know, you're notifying somebody, like you're mentioning somebody in this, and they'll, they'll get this um, this particular post. We'll, we'll, they'll get notified. So if somebody responds to you um, or you're responding to them, it's, it's the protocol is you always do the at and their username to make sure it, it pings on them and they, they can see that you mention them or replied and so forth. Yeah. Connie, let me uh, let me interrupt here for a sec. So we've got we're like halfway through the presentation. M maybe we should spread this into a two-part series. So let's. I would say maybe. Uh, w how would you feel about doing it? Maybe continuing next week at the meeting, because uh, for the meeting itself, we still actually had a little bit of other stuff to go through. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Would that yeah. be? Yep. Would that be okay? Yeah. No. yeah so uh, next. Yeah, yeah, just continue this as, as continuing education for us on this. This is good. Like right now, for example, it makes me think, like I always, uh, like on the hashtags, I always neglect it, but we should just, for all of us, we should have, okay, this is our official hashtag list where we always use that. Because uh, it takes a little bit of effort to just come up with that. Maybe that's one of the assets that we provide is, okay, here's our hash critical hashtag list. Because I know I, you know, I'm being autistic when I speak a lot, in my messages it's like I don't include the people that actually should be hearing that in it and this is just right. an example but anyway uh, so I think there's a lot of content we can cover and these are all good lessons um, how do we leave off for today do we um, let's see is there any things you know like right now after what we learned today what can we do after today uh, I think we're probably bottlenecked on, on having some of the prepared messaging I guess available because that's something yeah. we can share on all media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I'd like to, I'm just flipping down to slide 16 to just uh -huh. kind of wrap up today's lesson. There's two links in here. One, there's a wikihow.com to set up your Instagram accounts, accounts if you don't, uh -huh. uh, step by step. Um, there is also another link I included that I, I, I enjoy on Instagram and marketing. Um, and then I started a list of hashtags just for um, to get your minds going. Um, but again, this you know just the the hashtags that I put here will um, include in our HR kit. Somebody can always uh, you know go 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 grab one of those. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of those like. We should always be hashtagging Oshawa. That's Open Source Hardware Association. You know, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them that yeah, we really need to add to this. And you know, starting with myself, just start using all of them because I'm not right now really a lot of times. And the research could be like, at, you know, you know, one one active point could be we're researching the hashtags to actually find the groups that we should be reaching out to because there's many that we don't know that we should be reaching out to or maybe they're in a different country that you know we don't know about or something like that yeah 100 yeah, percent. you know this this will really start opening our eyes uh and building out our networks i mean just alone you know open source civil engineering is a big thing so you know throwing in your hashtags regarding you know around their world or if it's hydroponics or you know uh Whatever it may be, those, you know, those are key hashtags that we need to start including. That it, it just reaches um, points of interest. You know, people that are involved with those causes that are interconnected and become interconnected with OSC. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. 
Um, so maybe we'll just continue. We'll encourage, I guess, people to, to do Instagram. I, I should do that. I, I wouldn't mind doing it. It's just like discovering Facebook. I didn't really post to Facebook until like maybe two or three years ago, very actively. Um, right. So start start Instagram. So let's continue this maybe next um, next week. Pretty much um, pretty much the same time. Let's let's do another like half hour or so. Uh, of that, but yeah, right now we just gotta take take care of some other topics to finish up the meeting that we do have, so because we didn't cover a bunch of stuff, and Girl. yeah, let's do that. I think that's good. That's really good to get some continued feedback on this. Let's see any any questions for for Connie at this point, or yeah. So there's some comments going on. Um, Yeah, nothing specific on the questions yet. Um, Lex, do you have any questions or not? Not right now. Okay. All right. Hey, this is Josh. Uh, yeah, Josh. For uh, Connie, so um, I think there's a lot of engineers here, <laughs> uh -huh. and uh, engineers aren't necessarily known for being like the most social and, and uh, uh, I don't know interactive people um so yeah i don't know where do you see uh kind of the i think there's kind of a balance between you know just working on the nitty-gritty stuff and then promoting this stuff do you see bringing more people in that are um, a little bit more focused on other stuff or uh, do you see it's all of us kind of working in every area like a bunch of expert generalists or is it kind of a little bit more specialization maybe martian has something to say about that too yeah, if I might, you know, Martin, ch chime in at any time. You know, our goal is to build a core HR team, so there'll be some some lead subject matter experts for this that will do a lot of the heavy lifting. However, um, you know that that glorious responsibility of um, you know continuing to uh, participate in this particular um, path. Um, still falls on you. However, the good news is engineers speak engineer. So, you know, the networks that you're going to be probably building and people that you might be reaching out or, you know, you guys are, you know, you'll have some, some shared characteristics. So you guys almost speak your own language. Um, so don't, don't get too hung up on being, um, you know, that, 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 that social piece or that, that conversational piece. You know, we might give you, you know, certain groups, you know, because nobody wants to be uncomfortable or put into an uncomfortable situation because that's just not good. You won't know, be a very good recruiter, but you'll, you'll still be able to participate in messaging and, and, and getting other people um, to know about what you're doing and what we're doing and, and so forth. Does that make sense? And, and Martin, go ahead. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, I mean, there's some low hanging fruit that we can make it easy for everyone on a team to share good messages, like just the prepared, simple canned messages on recruiting that are well thought out they might come with an attractive pictures proper hashtags and just share it and that's it and uh, so make yeah. it easy and but on the other side we we do need a very serious recruiting team like for example subject matter experts on just about anything I mean there's so many people in FreeCAD and all these other projects that want to contribute but we just haven't reached out to them just like yesterday Brad Collette you know the developer of the path workbench a critical tool that we use you know he's really willing to help and he you know he even lives you know three hours from me so we gotta make that kind of effort to reach out because there's so much resource that we can tap and mo many people are so willing to help so that's why it's such a golden opportunity and we want to capitalize on it because we just have a lot of development work to do and and it's you know it takes more than a few people to do it like right now we have a small small developer team but that has to grow we got to get new developer you know different developer topics different meetings going that's that's all to be done so we we're not going to go there get there without some dedicated help on people actively recruiting and managing the community that's those are just missing roles that we have right now so we need that and to get some formal experience from the business world of how that's done I mean there's proven ways to do it we just need to tap them and just learn learn more about it so expand our skill set uh, to some other areas but that's that's a good question 
Right. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's you know that's um, we'll, we'll let's leave the recruiting discussion. So our our goal is to prepare some easy access materials that our HR toolkit for all of our developers to use as they can. It's just another tool that they will have, just like we're learning FreeCAD. You can learn learn some recruiting things like that. Um, so yeah, thank you, Connie. So we'll have you back. Just please show up again at um, 1.30 p.m. next week, and we'll, we'll continue the discussion. And of course, you're welcome to get bored with what we're going to talk here right now, or you can just pop off. But yeah, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next week again. We look forward to that. Definitely, definitely some good insights, and we'll be in touch on other other areas. So thank you, Connie. Okay, and we'll, thank you all. See you next week. Okay. And we'll just continue with our regular meeting here just to wrap up what we've been talking about. So yeah, there's that. We, we left off on the FreeCAD programming, which is an exciting topic that, just like we're talking about learning skill sets, I think there's, there is a lot of, uh, lot of things, just like Michelle is working on WebGL, uh, within FreeCAD, we can start actually contributing to it in a sig significant way. And also, if when we understand the process of how to develop FreeCAD, we can inv more easily invite others with very specific tasks. It's not this, you know, super overwhelming thing. It's something we can get more engaged with. So I look forward to Stephen's, more of Stephen's work on that. He did a little video explaining what he's done on FreeCAD programming so far, just for people who are curious about it. So please take a look at that. Uh, starting slide seven, then uh, slide eight, slide nine. Yeah, he's pretty much laying out the critical resources of how you get started with that, which is great because I don't think there's any com comprehensive guide on that out on the internet. So I think that's really seminal work that we can do for the community. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we have here? So, Michelle, do you have any um, any further comments on or progress on the WebGL stuff? Quick update or? Well, I'm, I started uh, the basics of the, of the add-on, uh, but there's still uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, okay. To, but it's, it's, it's going better than I expected. So uh, I, I suppose uh, next week maybe I can present the first version uh, of the add-on. Uh, and it will make things uh, a lot easier to, to make explosion view models uh, for everyone. Okay. And first, first I'm working on the add-on because it's going to change the complete workflow. Once that's ready, uh, I can make videos uh, about working with the add-on and uh, all the, all the, uh, the rest is going to be uh, outdated. So first, I'm gonna make the add-on. Okay. All right. Uh, keep going with that. That's that's a important piece, the puzzle. Let's see. Um, let's take a look at some of the comments, questions, comments before we go back just into the the tractor work. Just uh, finalizing on that. Um, Yeah, let's see. So, let's see. Question comes. Some of the CAD files uploaded did not really follow the file simplification protocol. Mostly in that editable versions are needed first. Might need to make sure that make that a priority for a few days. See the link to it on the new devs page. Uh, who did that? Who said that? Anyone? Abe. New devs page. What is the new devs page? Is there a link to that? What's which to it on a new devs page? Um, I, I think that's the. I think there is a new dev page. It's the training page. Can't remember what. I think it's called the new developers page. Oh. Uh, new developer up. orientation. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's got the free cab a lot of the FreeCAD 101 or the links to it on there. It's got links to everything. I think the um, uh, the video that was done recently for orientation and all that, uh -huh. so that's one of the problems. I can't remember the names of things to search for in the wiki a lot, so sometimes it's hard to find mm -hmm. the page. 
That could be the new developer's orientation page. Yeah. Um, okay, regarding the file simplify, like the, the way that files are posted on the, like for whatever project we have, what I've been doing is sometimes just being really random about it. Like I will upload a new file and for example, the power cube, I uploaded the simple, simple power cube over the, the complete power cube as a small placeholder. But the idea is you got to read the, co the comments in the, um, the, either the notes or the c comments for the upload such that you can get oriented where like what qualities each file has so so as long as all the files are there that's good because i know that people will for example find some some new thing that they want to show in a file they want to upload it and it won't necessarily be like the progression from complex to simple uh, as long as i think the files are all there and you can read their description i think that is good um, and of course if something is not following uh, the protocol properly you know take it and correct it if you can uh, and then yeah yeah I think I think that kind of can solve solve itself there can be it's allowed that there's a lot of different file versions but as long as we know which which one each is then then we could be okay and and what I would say finally at the end I think open ecology.org the website I mean, there is a GVCS page on a website itself, and maybe we can put the final versions up there and have the wiki do a lot of the, the working version stuff. So I think that's that's one way to take a look at that, to, to consider that. Um, let's see. More international developers, a separate Jitsi meeting that may be nice for, for an always open study hall meeting place. Uh, do we have a suggestions for a particular time and place for that? Before we did kind of a, I don't know, we just did stuff on Saturday, but I was thinking that um, uh, some people have to show up at 3 in the morning for that. So I'm right. thinking maybe, of course, we were doing like a long time throughout the day, and that's one way to do it, and then just people drop in for a particular hour. And if, as long as there's a few people there, um, people can kind of communicate down the chain or something mm -hmm. uh, for different time zones. Um, but I was thinking maybe we'd want a separate like Jitsi link for that. And I, I don't know how um, the Jitsi server setup is coming along. Maybe that will help. Okay. I mean, I know we don't have a ton of people right now, but I really, right. uh, if we had 20 or more people, then it, it probably would be useful to have uh, maybe you know more teams or, or uh, yeah different meetings. Yeah, I think right now we're on we're on kind of like you know low numbers, and German, who's the three a.m. guy. I mean, he he kind of has had to go for like a month, so I think we can revisit this once we have a few more people, because uh, right now we're kind of lean on a lean on a team pretty much. Okay, next next question. So we Weevolver, um, that's interesting. So I do know about Weevolver. Perfect place to build hardware together. I, I'm I'm not sure what their development platform is about. I mean, I've heard about it, but um, does anyone know anything more about it? Would would have to study it to get insight. Does anyone have insight on what that is? I just put that in there as well as a comment because um, it's it's not really I said competing platform, but it's really just a web platform. But it's kind of interesting as a. Um, comparison to see somebody else trying to do a platform for hardware development yeah. really it's just a website i mean it's not like an educational organization kind of like you know targeting oscdb or anything like that it's just a website and obviously it's closed as far as the website itself but have they have a different a web arrangement uh kind of a format really for letting people do hardware and there's a bunch of open source uh hardware you know development going on on that side it looks like a bunch of different open source organizations are building little projects and posting them on there yeah yeah even though it's, it's beta so um that's i guess one place to i don't know look at or, or maybe contact some of those organizations maybe they're uh maybe that uh, another hr uh, 
kind of social media opportunity to look at uh, yeah I mean these other they're, they're not really like necessarily it's just ecology stuff but you know some of it could have some overlap yeah I mean they're definitely we talked to them before I met with those guys and uh, they invited us to post the project on there. I mean, we can post this, just a matter of taking the time to do it. I mean, right now, just you know, they invited us, but I've never, never done it yet. It's one of those things to do, still. But it's a, it's a cool platform. They don't, they're not open source centric. They're just uh, hacker centric. But they're not, not all their, all their projects are open source. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's another place to post out of, out of many. Uh, so right now we are we are actively pursuing Hero X, so that is um, Hero X, the crowd design challenge platform where you can also crowd crowdfund. So we're gonna put on a challenge on a on a cordless drill, 3D printed cordless drill, which would include developing an industrial grade 3D printer to produce that cordless drill and so forth. So uh, that's that's big deal. We're gonna do that. Um, I mean that's gonna be a big big deal. We're gonna spend a few months preparing that. And then posting it and raising money to do like this could be actually like the 10x you know 10x as in we're so far on the development team this could 10 exit or 100 exit if we spawn a design challenge and there's hundreds or thousands of people that actually compete for it because there's a big cash reward and we're looking at uh, between a hundred thousand dollars and a million bucks for an for a reward and how do you do that well, you go to start by going to open other open source organizations, get like ten thousand a pop from ten players, get a hundred k, crowdfund to two hundred k, and ask corporations to match it fivefold to a million dollars. That's the current nutshell. But that's that's what I'm uh, pursuing right now as a concept. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll start by by simply posting the challenge and getting getting that like a pre pre release up there so to let people look at it. But I mean, think about it. It's it's like if you've got the idea, you can sell it. People can contribute money to it, and then you can spawn major, major development coming from it. So it's a it's an amazing opportunity that that we do have, and we want to pursue it. I do believe a lot in this crowdfunded, crowd design challenge. I think that is the next step of how uh, products can be developed, like in an, an open source economy format. You you create prizes. People compete for them, and the dynamics are a little different than just you know working for somebody. It's a lot of it is, is the psychology of humans of the competition, the incentive, the fame and glory aspects of that. There's different psychological forces that go in there um, with an incentivized reward. This is based on the the X Prize concept, but it's a spin-off from the X Prize. But just very exciting. I mean, I, I'm I'm quite excited about the possibility there, and of course it's not not no free lunch. You, get, you really got to prepare this well. But I think our project lends itself really well to, to to a challenge like that, as opposed to a Kickstarter where Kickstarter is, Kickstarter is kind of static. It's like you get money and you do it. Here the crowd does it. That's the that's the main difference, and it could be powerful. So we'll see we'll see what happens. Just early stages of that. Okay, next. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just one real quick thing about that. Um, uh, have you seen a, or heard of Kaggle before? They yeah. Of, like machine learning competitions. No, uh, I've heard of Kaggle as in uh, uh, collaborative diagramming software. Is that what we're talking about? It's a uh, yeah, a, like a. They, they say the home of data science and machine learning. So it's okay. it's a lot of like, they, but they host a ton of like um, uh, machine learning competitions. So you know. They would train different models, and the best model that's most predictive wins a certain prize or something. Yeah. So, um, that that might just be something uh, uh, cool to look out for. So how do we do? How do we implement machine learning to like? How do we do this for uh, us? Create an AI for developing open source hardware. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be cool. I was just saying, in a more general sense, like they're one of you know they're they're really powerful and very common. In learning space about like uh -huh. how to set up a competition to get a good result so there might be something to learn from that kind okay of aspect of it. Yeah. study how to design a good competition yeah okay yeah yeah well if you want to do that and feed us back some insights on it yeah we can 
that's worth knowing that's worth studying just like it's worth studying like how exactly does hero x work because i think there's huge potential if you understand those how those mechanisms work you can do a lot i think okay um note taking quality is relative to communications quality so maybe one main note taker but everyone with critical info to convey should check the notes and add important missed info collaborative note taking will improve team interaction as well do we have notes and do we have collaboration on those notes for today Jose, where are the notes? I was taking the notes in my novel because uh, it was really slow when I started writing the presentation. So, but yeah. Are you gonna you gonna post that to the to this? Yeah, but I can I can put it right now. So yep. Just that it was really slow when, when I wanted to write directly there. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, next, next, um, next comment. Does the Bobcat standard necessitate the use of CNC cut metal as designer can stock tubing be used if that is more efficient? Well, if unless we use the standard, I mean, it doesn't have to be CNC cut, but it needs to be precision cut. I mean, if you want to do by hand, I mean, anything you can do CNC cut can be done by hand. But by hand, it's going to be you know ten times more time. So, but as far as we're going to integrate the the bit of uh, kind of do the hybrid bobcat with stock tubing, if there's a place to add some stock tubing to to make for attachment, we can fit that within the bobcat uh, standard geometry as well. So so yeah, we can we can kind of mix both of them together. We don't want to just do the tubing like we have right now. It's nice and fl very flexible. But it's got its limits, like you can't attach any existing Bobcat implements, of which there are millions out there. So we do want to include a connection to the industry standard. Okay, next. Are the physics of the loader such that getting the angle of the cylinders higher is ideal for easier lift? Yeah, the angle of the cylinders should be, should be as high from the pivot. That pivot angle, yeah, that angle should be as high as possible so that you've got good force like the sine theta concept like if the angle is too small you don't have any force if theta is zero you have zero force you gotta have the proper geometry for better lift but the cylinders are very powerful but we we do have to do that as far as calculations go the calculations section for the life track construction set means that we document those calculations okay what what is the geometry that we have and how much actual lift force are we getting Okay, more design sprints on sprint Saturday study hall or a separate Jitsi link for open study hall so people of different time zones can have discussion at easier times. Um, I did. Uh, I showed up last time. Nobody really showed up for kind of study hall last Saturday at noontime. But uh, let's see. What's the best way to go right now for? Okay, as we go forward on a tractor, we I do want to lay out some comments here, but we we just don't have too many people that are available for this. Like three people, three or four people. But let's let's get to that in a second. Um, free CAD. He, he rocks maybe good for engaging other normal song. Normal is free Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's about it for the comments. Let's go back just a little bit to the tractor and then to, to rolls, because, um, I mean, we really don't have so many people that are available. We got Abe, we got um, Josh. Who else we got that's actually ready for some CAD work? I mean, um, let's see. Stevens, other stuff. Ahmed, Alejandro, Christian, Dixon, German, Israel, Jose. Josh, Michelle, Oliver, Roberto. We got like Roberto, Josh, and Abe, really. I mean, all the other people are doing stuff or really kind of like dropped off or, or something. So, on the... Okay, on a tractor, just to just to talk about slide number number five. Let's attach some names of people who are available. So, Bucket, Brush Hog, Tiller, 
Uh, let's take those. Big cab for the big tractor. Big tractor design frame. Uh, who can we get on those things? So, yeah, we really got to divvy it up. Uh, Abe, what are you up to lately? Are you, are you done with your tasks, or...? Yeah. some of that uh there's a bunch of stuff that still isn't quite accurate and i know right. it's not immediately important but it would be nice to get you know the tracks and, and all this as accurate as possible yeah um, and, i think and i know that there hmm. might be changes uh still coming on it like i guess we want to change the front and i guess on those loaders the loader arms or the the attachment of the loader arms down there it sounds like we want to change that on the frame yeah yeah um, I guess the idea is to make that higher if we put, um, yeah, so if we put that bottom bar, uh, uh, sections of two whole tubing that are cut there, that will actually raise the, uh, okay, let me discuss that. It'll lower the angle. Okay. Let me discuss that there. Which is, yeah. You can't put it. Okay. So the mounting point, you cannot put it lower because there's tracks there. So you got to keep it that height. The thing that you can change, are you seeing my screen? Um, no. I don't Let me um, uh, show my screen here. Actually, so yeah, this is, shared, okay, uh, I'm sharing, Go. I'm going back to sharing my screen. And if you look at, so I'm sharing the screen, I'm looking at the lower attachment point that cannot be lower. If it's higher, it's worse for the angle compared to the loader it will be a lower angle <clears throat> that means you're not using the force effectively so what we want to do can you see my screen now yes I can see it okay so and I'll do it in real time here look at right there I'm gonna go to orthographic view and what we want to do there the geometry should change such that the pivot point here that needs to go up in order to increase the angle between the cylinder line and the line of the loader the pivot is the critical pivot point and this is the the bottom of the cylinder is the other critical point but the angle uh, so if I draw that out I can do a sketch on that flat face and here's what I would do um, okay, it's upside down. It turned it upside down for me. But what what we need to do is um, so if you look at me drawing, what needs to happen there is we need to go up like this here. So let's say, you know, I'm approximating our loader arms here. We need to mount that pivot like up higher here somewhere not not really there we need to move it like right here somewhere so that the angle uh, if I draw a line here that angle now goes from here to there does that make sense okay, yeah so we kind of need we'll that change the shape of the arms more yeah yeah because that angle between the that's other, yeah yep I guess the only other is to actually extend the uh, arm mount point above the power cube, which I think you were wanting to keep it as low as possible, but... No, I mean, how are you going to... More... I don't know how you're going to do that. How are you going to... Where are you going to attach to the loader arms? So... Well, I mean, make the actual frame taller above the power cube would be the... Yeah, we don't want to go up. You want to go as low as you can for center of gravity purposes. So, okay. I mean, this is, uh, I showed where the person is. But if you, if you look at, uh, so the critical thing is, uh, look at how tall the person is. Look at that. But what does that mean? That means your arms, this is the proper working height. You're standing, your head is up there. 
your arms are right there comfortable on the controls of the machine if it's any higher it's not good this is like if you look at the the Toro Dingo pictures online or users using them that's how it is and that's correct yeah we don't want to extend make any extensions above I mean first of all that's the frame is at this low level that's where the structure is the higher you raise it the less stable the entire structure is so you want to attach as low on the frame as possible so that's a good attachment point it's pretty low here the loader arm is that high it's as high as the power cube but that's you don't want it any higher of course you can make it higher you can get crazy you know lift crazy lift like you can you know, go up like 10 feet if you want with the lift but it's unstable you want the center of gravity this is real for rough terrain you're on slopes you don't want this thing flipping over that's a very real consideration for safety uh, right now this machine is safe and usable that's unlike the machine from 2015 we built which was almost as tall as the person if you're on any of an incline you can get killed by that when the thing tips over so this is good we don't want to go higher now for if we do the larger tracked version which is gonna be a little longer it has to be wider so it doesn't tip uh, and the person first of all is gonna be um, sitting in a cab and the cab is gonna be protecting the operator so the cab is gonna be a steel same the same tubing we can weld that up um, and that would work well so for the large tractor we need to have enough room for the power cubes and enough for the the cab in fact for the larger version we might have the power cubes on the more like uh, 90 degrees from this so they're actually the long way is lateral not to the front like the right now it's the long way is pointing to the front maybe in a in a big tractor we have two of them not side to side but maybe pointing to the side so it's actually 60 inch of frame wide which is five feet which is still acceptable because then you get one foot for the track one side and the other so it's seven feet wide so that would be acceptable there but here the geometry like this now on the geometry of the arms gets into real detail this is like okay we need to basically do a sketch where we get the exact you know extract a sketch out of this and get the exact uh, points uh, of how far it goes up and just just a little refinement but but believe it or not I mean this geometry here is ex extremely good already I mean it's literally as is right here if we mounted it right there this angle could be a little bigger here because that angle this angle intersection of this line which is the loader arm line and intersection of the cylinder line they're like 10 degrees or something like that 10 20 degrees what sign of 10 or 20 degrees it's like 0.1 or so something like that but uh, it still has enough force because the cylinders 2.5 inch cylinders would have like 10,000 I don't know what is it pi r squared which is 3 6 two, it's still like 15 or 20,000 pounds of lift but reduced by that angle you get like 2,000 pounds of lift so it's still acceptable as is right now like right now hey, uh, yeah this is Josh yep. um, I just, can I uh, jump in and share my screen really yeah go ahead too, uh, just talking about this loader arms yeah uh, um, I just kind of want to okay. can you guys see it uh yeah 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 okay so this was the sketch I did for that loader arm. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if uh, you know anyone else was watching or still around. I mean, it's been a long meeting, but yeah. I just figured I would kind of go through what, how I did this and yeah. what I was thinking, so that yeah, yeah. it might help for you know, some things in the near future. Uh, so I kind of went about first. I just kind of sketched out this tire, and I started with my origin, just as that point loader arm. Um, and then I just kind of sketched in a rough, uh, actually I started with this one line just to kind of see where I wanted to go to. And then I kind of, I jumped back to the other model and looked at, okay, I need to kind of bend down this, this point and 
error in there because I needed, um, or this at least uh, track kind of rough circle here. Um, and then I started sketching in a, a line for the, you know, this was my thought about a hydraulic point. It looks like we ended up mounting, you know, in a totally different spot. And um, so that was, that was cool. It was something I wasn't expecting. And it's nice to like see that come together. And uh, so what my, my plan, and I think this is a, a pretty easy thing to do then, is since you have this kind of construction geometry that's like controlling pretty much all of this stuff, it's only a few points, right? Instead of like defining all these angle, you know, this arc lengths and stuff, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a few lines here of construction geometry that kind of define all this. Exactly. Uh, and so then it's really easy to just, you know, say, oh, okay, I want to add in another construction line that can, kind of controls this point to this point, and then we can kind of um, move that up, and then this path would, you know, you just break a few lines, add a couple in, a couple more arcs, and uh, I mean, that's a, a pretty simple thing to, to change and do. So I just thought... Um, and the question is, where, that's that's really good, and where is this file? Uh, this is the loader on file, so yeah, it's called loader on. Okay, the original one that's uploaded there? That's the sketch underneath yeah, it? Yeah, so this was the main okay. sketch that I, you, know, you can see the white lines are the actual ones. Yep. That's good. That's good. So that that is in there. And what I did with that is I actually took a look at it, and um, I see it's all constraint. So I removed some of the constraints and st started moving it around. And and yeah, like you have that short cylinder mount point. I don't think we can get the cylinders that short there that would actually work out for the geometry. So yeah, that would be hard to make it work there because of the just the spatial constraints of fitting a cylinder in there. So yeah. that's. Uh, but yeah, I think what we have right now is not not bad. I mean, we'll, we'll continue working it. Maybe we decide that. No, I, I mean, I really like it. I mean, I, I like where it is right now. Here, if if we were to mount, let's see, am I sharing my screen? Yeah, if we were to mount, like, yeah, it's getting really tight there, because uh, you still have to consider the, yeah, like mounting the cylinder here would be, I think, pretty impossible. Because you could you yeah. could mount it there, but then a, the amount of rays it would have would be very limited. So absolutely, yeah. And I didn't realize you know the track was going to take up a lot of that space as well. So I was thinking yeah. we could mount it much lower. And, um, no, that's that's all yeah. full. There's no yeah. space there at all. So absolutely. So yeah, I like where the, the mount is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it ended up working out quite well. So I, I mean, I, I'm really proud of this design here. This is awesome. Like in terms of a compact machine. And the trick to that is that, of course, we're cutting angles. Like before, we were trying to just do, use the tubing and work with that. But you can't. You, you really have to do a very specific geometry on the loader arms that has to be the right angles and everything. So uh, we got to keep going on this. But I would suggest, um, so, yeah, how best to divide this. There, there are details on this. But I would say because there's already on this design so many dependencies that we'll have to end up changing a lot of things for a concept this is good and then we have to go very carefully detail by detail on examining the geometry and filling in details so what i would suggest is that you guys move on to the uh, i can continue working on this but uh and then just start refining the geometries here like the only thing I would ask for on this one is just to make these posts vertical here instead of this horizontal one. That's a relatively easy task. But beyond that, it gets into real refinement. So it's like, you know, streamlining. Like, do we need this point up here a little bit or are we actually okay there? I make some design decisions based on that. If it's down here, it's a nice straight line, which makes it easier to fabricate. It's got less lift power, but it looks like you can still lift like... Uh, we'll have to look at the details. It might be as small as 500 pounds, but it's it could be as big as 2,000 pounds, which is which would be very acceptable. If we can only lift like 500, no, that wouldn't be acceptable because what if you want to take a stump out of the ground with all the force you've got? You'd rather have at least 2,000 pounds of lift on the load the loader itself, because while it might be 2,000 pounds of lift at the pivot up up here because it's a cantilever 
because you're all the way out here, that really reduces the amount you can lift to like about fourfold because it's about one fourth the distance to the loader. So there's a leverage there that reduces your possible lift. So details like that. But I mean, I've played around with this a lot. So I think you guys should probably leave this to me um, as far as this. And we want to design the design requirement would be at least 2,000 pounds of lift force. Even though, the, I mean, that's the weight of the, this machine's going to weigh around 2,000 pounds. Uh, maybe less, maybe 1,500 pounds, but I'd like to really have like at least 2,000 pounds of lift because the cylinders themselves, if you do pi r squared at for 2.5 inch cylinders and 3,000 psi or 2,000 psi, you notice that that's 20,000 pounds of lift that they're pushing with. So we have a lot to play with. In other words, the this geometry here is almost it's possibly acceptable. And we might even want to use a, like a shorter cylinder, so we mount it, move that pivot point a little far further to the front to get a better angle. So we'll we'll see. But um, that's that's just some detailed uh, detailed drawings, which depend in the real life on what exactly we do on these details of mounting, because we want to restrict ourselves a little bit to the good geometry that we have already. Like for example, we don't want to go different than the five hole tubing you know like don't make it like 5.5 holes right because it's you know that's what we have already and it's it's good and convenient the width is good right now um so it's just some tweaking here so i would say on the longer the larger tractor there are things to do there and that is to to get the baseline geometry of that so use the very simple power cube like the very simple model if you go to the power cube 17.08 you'll see that there's a simple power cube that's like 3K, that's just a cube. Um, actually, that is in here too, right there actually. There's that cube right there, that's just like a three kilobyte cube with no detail. We can work with that, do a, another base platform, which is wider and longer, and fit two power cubes, one cab, and uh, base frame. That's the next next uh, next deal. Uh, we can try both the um, side by side like this, or so that means 40 wide base or a 60 wide base. We should try those both and see how a cab fits on that. So maybe uh, maybe that would be a task. It's just a, like a simple geometry task, but um, yeah, we we want to explore what the best geometry would right now be for the next next tractor uh, so how do we want to break this up guys well I mean we can go let's do I mean to do it like microtasking cab frame power cubes um, well, cab frame are the two things critical. How do we do it? Cab frame and tracks. No, let's let's do tracks. Longer tracks. Three people. Can we do that? So design longer tracks. Design a cab that person can sit in and uh, frame. Can we break it up like that? And then as soon as we have those three, we put them into one document. Okay, that uh, sounds good. We just want to kind of make rough estimates on that. And, uh... Let's specify. So let's make the tracks instead of uh, 40 inches right now. Let's make them 50 inches. And why? Like the, basically the requirement there is... Requirement there is... Uh, we talked about in one of the design videos that you want the width to be as large compared to the length as possible for easier turning. So if the tracks are 50 and the machine is, say, like 60, so say cab is 60 inches long, we, we just got to decide on some numbers here, like 60 inches versus 50 inches or something, which are nice round numbers and multiples of four. Well, this isn't a multiple of four, but the frame has to be a multiple of four. No, cab, sorry, that's the tractor is 60 inches. The cab would be whatever a human can fit into. So maybe like 
like 30 inches, 32 inches by 48 inches. I mean, I don't know, like um, what we can do for the cab is we can, no, we got to go from scratch because the one on Life Track 6 was way too big. It wasn't, wasn't right size. I would say 32 by 48 by 30, let's say. Let's see how that would look. 24, 30, uh, maybe 36. Let's do that. So big tractor frame is 60 inches long, let's say. So that, or maybe 64. We don't know. I mean, we got it. It's like once we fit fit the things within the frame and then put loader arms. The loader arms would go go on the cab probably that's the most logical place because that's a nice structure that's going to exist um so the the platform can perhaps be just a base without verticals and the cab could be a uh, just a cube that bolts to the base frame but it has to bolt somewhere so um is that enough information to go on at this point because i mean we don't i mean we're literally starting from scratch we just gotta make it fit and then the trick is going to be the geometry of the loader arms because that's like the most important thing how much lift can you get and does it all fit uh, but I would do this start 60 inch long uh, and we can make 40 inch or 60 inch for width depending on whether the power cubes are forwards or to the side and I can't really tell, like, without actually drawing it up. By visual examination, you can kind of see, okay, yeah, this makes sense, or this doesn't make sense, you know? So we probably want to do probably both frames, 40 and 60. I'm kind of suspecting 60 would be the right thing. So maybe let's just start with 60. Uh, maybe have them side to side. Because then if the cab is in the front of that, that would make the machine not too long. You don't want to make the machine too long. You want it enough to be stable back and forth, but you don't want it so long that it's very hard to turn with the tracks. Because remember, the tracks put a lot of force on the machine. Like, So the wider the machine is, the easier it is to turn with the tracks. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, I assume that the cab is just a small seat with the controls right in front of the, um, the seat. Yeah, Pretty yeah. Pretty tight space. Um, yeah, it's as small as possible, but it has to enclose the operator for safety. So the cab is yeah. a cube. and But the control's not in the front because you have to typically get in and out through the front. So the controls are on the side, so one side and the other side. Typically, the way Bobcats, you get into them, the controls are on the sides, you get in from the front. Because the side is going to have the loader arms. So it's going to be hard to get in from the sides if you have loader arms on your sides unless you mount your lo loader arms somewhere else. But for assuming a basic cab and loader arms on the side, the only place you can get in is either the top or the front. <laughs> so the front makes more logical sense. So you step over the bucket and you get into the cab like a bobcat. I think too, if we're making the frame a little longer, if the frame sticks out a little in front of the tracks or yeah. see the arms, there's not a lot of clearance between the arms and the tracks on this one right now either, but if we extend that out a little more, um, maybe, I don't know about on this one. On this one, the mounting, like you said, is pretty good. I can see the forces there are probably okay, but uh, if we wanted to mount cylinders, of course, like you said, they could be shorter too. I guess some of that is in, in flux. So, But if we extended the frame in front more, and I guess on this one, the frame is further back more, and not so much in the front because we want to be able to mount stuff on the back and maybe uh and and so that somebody can walk behind i guess nobody's going to stand on anything back there right right on the it's a one. it's a walk behind you can have a small platform that's uh, on the back which is basically attached to the back and it's low to the ground so the operator can get on it but it's just back further behind this back end of the platform uh, so it's comfortable like say you you know you you know you're doing like a lot of walking you can just stand on it for ease of operation yeah yeah so let's see on the bigger one is the cab uh i guess you've done ones like that before you said it was too top heavy is the cab 
have to be like a full roll cage. I yeah, mean, we're trying to make it wider, so. I would make it a full roll cage for safety. I'm I'm thinking, you're doing tree work. You want full enclosure. The tree work, yeah, like if you're okay. doing anything around trees, that's you can kill yourself really easily if you know you're pushing a tree over it lands on you, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, you want a full full cage. None of the, not a roll bar. Roll bar is for plain field agriculture, <clears throat> not yeah. anything surround for surrounding forestry. Yep. Um, yeah. So full cage, definitely. Now, because we're saying if the power cubes go behind, then we might end up mounting the loader because loader arms want to be mounted as far back as possible to get the most lift otherwise you're too front heavy so you want to mount the loader arms as far back which which can the only thing i could see is instead of attaching the loader arms to the cab we might end up with some separate attachments further back i don't know we'll see so um uh, and if we do the trained configuration, say we attach, so so we want to design it such that we have a hitch on either of these, so you can put two of these together, one small tractor and one big tractor, and you can train them up together. So you'd have like a four track uh, articulated steering kind of a device. Uh, so that's, that's another thing we want to consider in the sense that it, if we have the loader arms uh, too far to the front, if we put on the back section to this two section tractor then the weight balance will be much better if you attach the back section to it it just a lot adds a lot of weight to the back in other words the loader arms may be quite fine being attached to the cab without causing any any tipping issues anyway well, once we actually draw it up um, we can see these we can extract these considerations out of the actual cab because right now it's hard to picture that without doing it so cab frame tracks well, one other point a major load point on this is these uh, mounting plates that bolt on the side yeah and i assume that um I, I don't know if the thickness on those is accurate i noticed it was like a third of an inch i was thinking maybe uh that's not accurate or we just need to go and thicker it needs to or be half we inch could add more. we could add more on the other side of the frame you know just bolt in some thinner ones if that's seems important for the load yeah the standard the heavier one yeah i mean standard is half inch plate is good that works well for that so half inch would be good and will also be good for the bigger machine as well uh half inch is pretty pretty solid yeah. if you have one inch it's bolts on it to, to bend or no um, bend all. and i assume that those plates are going to be welded around the shafts and it looks like we have minimal clearance on this one between the the shaft and the uh, frame. No, we're not. We're, we didn't show details there. You don't want to weld them because you want this to be designed for disassembly. So what you want to do? Remember uh -huh. the clamp collars. That's the secret weapon. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So those clamp collars. Yeah, they're going to go underneath. In other words, there has to be a half inch space to get them around, like at least enough space to get the clamp collars around it. Or you can put those clamp collars like outside here, right there like a small one bolt clamp collar but before what we did is we put them on under here in other words there was enough enough clearance like maybe an inch of clearance so we might have to add uh you know half an inch more clearance to here uh but that's that's details i think we're pretty good because that's just like minor mods on the general structure that we have now those are critical mods like when we actually come to building it that's going to be absolutely critical whether you actually can build it or you can't and absolute has to be des designed before we go into the, the the build but at this point we're pretty good for the where we are right now and we'll go back to that but clamp collars are a secret weapon like here we're going to put a clamp collar here so that the loader arms don't slip off the the pivot and so forth. Yeah, I figured those went on there. I was trying to figure out where, uh, how are we going to attach them? Although I guess you're bolting some other They're piece bolting. into the clamp collar, so technically you could put another metal piece in there with an angle and then attach it to other things at different angles. So, um, because 
And, and I drew those clamp collars. I didn't split them yet. I guess that might be. I don't know if they need to be shown that way, but. Yeah, we. I mean, for the final yeah. cat, yeah, we want to split them. Like right now, it's not critical because we know how that works and we know okay. it's a split there. But I mean, for actual accurate exploded part diagrams, yes, you want to show how they really look. Uh, for now, we're okay. I yeah, I think I got the detail on the bushings and the clamp collars uh, correct based off of that pipe chart. So I, I was trying to get as much stuff as I could correct to the actual size. Okay, but it's, uh, okay, so okay, detail on there. That's not pipe because there is no pipe that's, that's accurate. I, I mentioned in the comments, for low resource environments, you can use pipe, which is not going to have a tight fit, but you do want a tight fit here just so things don't wobble around at all you want this to be tight in other words you're using three inch exact pipe which is more expensive not like the xxxh heavy wall uh tube pipe you you're actually using this other kind of pipe which is the exact one which is much more expensive so oh, okay. yeah we need to do that there it's, it's a precise yeah uh, pipe for, for the bushing okay. yeah 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 now you can get away even without it but you'd have wobble and that would you know wear out over time so it wouldn't be a anything like lifetime design for those points where there's a lot of stress you want it to be pretty nice um, now for here we can do a cutout like for the loader arms here we can cut out with cnc a reasonable um, but if, i mean yeah you, you really want to yeah you want on some of those wear points yeah to ever do tapped in those or yeah yeah the proper way to do it would be to have grease fittings to be tapped in there and we can talk about that later yeah like here these yeah. these arms are going to actually pivot around this bar so the point is it's fixed here that's a fixed connection like right there with against here that's fixed but it pivots here so the wear is going to be here so actually we want to put in the three inch precise bushings right here where the wear all the wear is going to be right here if you don't have that precise bushing there this would just wear you know just grind into each other uh, so you want that precise bushing on the shaft here uh, so those are all details but we know how to do that That's, there's no mysteries there um, but those details are not drawn in yet and we can okay. we can wait for that um, yep Besides that, I mean, I think this is in good shape. I mean, so far, you know, way ahead of what we did last time. I mean, with the geometry. I mean, Lex was there. He saw the mass. <laughs> I mean, the tractors work, but too tall, you know, and didn't have a loader. Uh, because the power cubes, uh, because we used the, the bolted power cubes, it was just too much mess and interference with the bolts everywhere. It's just unworkable. That's why right now we're doing a simpler power cube, non-structural. And putting the structure in elsewhere, which is through these verticals. Yeah. Okay, I think that file isn't the most up to date either. I believe I at least rotated that motor, and uh, it probably doesn't have the latest plate in there. But that's not important. Yeah. I'm still working on that plate. Yeah. No. Upload. Um, upload the latest one. Yeah. yeah. I think. Well, I I did. It's up there. I think you just. Oh, okay. You know, you probably don't have it yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I did that yesterday. But okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I'm behind the times that on that. The, I've got to adjust the, the motor as well. Uh, there's a bunch of work to do there. I've got to find CAD files. Sometimes the CAD files have not been, from that older stuff, haven't been very editable. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. occasionally I have to redraw some of that. But Yeah, and did you go um, back in history to see if they're editable? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've been looking. Okay. I, I, I ran searches. And same on the on the tracks. I ran searches back to the original track parts, but um, they they were different than I thought. Actually, I don't think these tracks are necessarily update with the latest design because I think you're using bolts and you know technically the pins don't look right and all that. But that's not critical, I guess. I yeah. Don't know if there's, were you using rollers in the new oh, tracks? Oh yeah. Because the photos. I was. The photos don't even go. Right. I yeah. It's photos may not be right either no this is not to... this track is not super accurate it's yeah it's not it's not accurate it just shows the general shape but the detail is wrong here uh and i think what we can also do is instead of using pins bolts with nuts work really well 
I mean, otherwise you use use pins, but just one inch bolts are okay as well. So, I mean, for the purpose of just, you know, common parts, a bolt that you don't have to even yeah. use a pin. I've, yeah. I've heard somebody's telling me about this, the track, they said that those pins wear out constantly. Mm -hmm. They constantly have to fix them and weld them, so... Uh, well, I'm not sure about... Yeah, I mean, I've I've used the tractor here for like months of time and the pins seem to be pretty fine. I mean, we have the rollers on the pins. The rollers are what roll against oh. the cog. So maybe you're talking about a different design maybe. Um yeah, probably. But no, these these uh these are actually holding up quite well cuz actually the the in this design the the pins do not rotate. It's the rollers here that rotate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's actually pretty decent yeah. for a very simple design that we have. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, I mean, I'm concerned about the wear. What you have is the, you know, you got the, just a comment here, you got idlers, which are metal, and then there's the metal of these, uh, this is all metal here. It's metal on metal. So what I'm concerned about is the metal of this wearing out on, uh, on an idler here. But it hasn't done so far. It's pretty, you know, it's holding up relatively well. So that's, that's okay. As long as the... The hardnesses are similar. Uh, yeah. Major steel hardness ratings, right? That it should be closer the better. So I, I think. Um, yeah. I think actually you want the opposite, right? Like, oh no. If you have a surface, <laughs> you want to make sure that one component is wearing, so that if you're yeah. replacing it, you replace that component. No, yeah. I think you probably Which want yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I think probably here you want the the idlers to be hardened. But I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is this is like we need right here. We need a track designer, a guy who knows about like metalware. Uh, yeah, I don't know how exactly you're making those idlers because you're you're custom building those out of cut material, right? The idlers, they're all out of ten inch pipe. That That's a ten inch pipe, heavy wall pipe. Oh, okay. And then you're welding some other pieces. And you're welding okay, the so plates on top. Those, are those those are probably easier to ma to make. Than mass producing all of that track, right? Well, because that track is not easy to produce, right? It's a lot of detailed handwork. Well, it wasn't too bad when you had a lot of people. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. so Lex did it. Um, what happens there when you do this track manually by cutting it with uh, either iron worker and a punch? It is too much work, but if you CNC cut all the pieces and just weld, it could be very easy. I mean, not very easy, but I mean, still a little bit of time, but no, not a big deal with a CNC torch. Last time we built it by hand, yes, it's a big deal. It's too much work. And of course, it was still doable because we had so many people there, but you want to CNC cut it. Yeah, I think we had like six people working pretty much the entire day. Yeah. Six people entire day to do all the tracks. I, I mean, yeah, even I think two it was days. The, the, yeah, the, just the cutting of the pad. So we had one yeah. person on the, um, yeah. on the cutter and then another person assembling parts. And we had two welders going at the same time, too, welding the, you know, the, the pieces that attach the, uh, the pad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But definitely, yeah, cutting. not recommended to do it cutting by hand but once you can cut out then all the track pieces by CNC and then what ended up happening what we did is you exactly as you see here what you see here does not work when this metal piece from one to the next is at the same level you have to notch out like all that so it doesn't interfere with the next track so we had to go back through all of that notch out every single one because it ended up on the corners it wouldn't really bend properly on the corners so but all the geometry could be put into the CNC cut, so now we know how to do it, and it's going to be easy. But uh, wouldn't do it without CNC. Like that's something we got to have our table torch table for that. If we don't, I'm just going to outsource that because that just takes too much time to do. Yeah. And of course, I guess rubber tracks. That's the cheaper yeah yeah so so i mean realistically speaking with a two foot by two foot bed printer you can print the rubber maybe with embedded nylon because you can have two material printing so that would be the cool thing put these idlers very close to one another so you make a much smaller track and you can print it on a like a two by two foot 3d printer 
So that would be the next step. We're not there yet, but we definitely want to do that soon because thermoplastic elastomer is out there. It's 3D printable. So definite cool thing to do. Okay, I'm trying to think of anything else because we're going long here. Yeah, but, okay, um, yeah, let's... I guess one thing I didn't understand was the, the Bobcat Quick Attachment Standard. What exactly parts is that? What What is that? Did, Okay, the, the idea for the Bobcat quick, quick Attach is this geometry here uh, from the side. So when you have an implement, it's got the corresponding geometry to that. So namely this edge here, that edge, that angle, it's a 45 degree angle for that amount. And on the bottom, it's this and that, those two pieces right there. That's the proper angles. And then the thing that goes into it, it goes into this to match that angle here and on top it goes above. On the bottom it goes above, so it's recessed here, so this is not, yeah, you gotta wait till this is finished up here. This is recessed so the implement goes actually to the inside of that, and there's a pin, there's two pins that lock the implement in, so you gotta just Google it up. Look, look at the wiki page, and then go, go look up some pictures on a but it's basically the geometry which has these angles and the fact that there's a pin that locks in the implement into this geometry. Two pins. Okay, so, so the pins. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't know if that was all it's in all there. in there in the standard. And the pins are a particular separation in terms of width. They're a particular separation between them that all implements have that they all fit to any kind of implement like that. So yeah, you have to define the geometry. That's the pin spacing and the geometry of this side profile. That's the two okay, things. Okay, so it's it's a front piece basically that attaches to the arms. I wasn't sure if the arms were. Uh, it attaches to the arms that. and pivots. It, it, that's not drawn yet, but that this thing tilts. That's called the okay. the. Oh. Yeah, it tilts. It's okay. not stiff like this. It tilts. So. There's a third, there's a cylinder that's missing here. We have not drawn in yet to the cylinder that actually moves the loader, the loader angle. I mean, the longer loader height, yeah, those are the two big cylinders. The other one, what we can do here is a single one in the middle that rotates okay. the. Okay, so there's like a dump option on yeah. it. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a dump cylinder. I think it's called curl. I don't know. I wonder if that can be really short because. Um, no, we gotta. Well. No, we gotta. There's there's geometry issues there. That's why I'm saying let's not touch this because there's too many details that are missing still, that require, uh, just finishing up with this. I mean, I should do that. Um, okay. Fit in so still fit in that last cylinder, which is a bit. I mean, that's gonna probably change some things around. It's gonna change. That might dictate that we definitely change that pin mounting or something. It'll change something. So, But what I like here is I can at least visually see that there is a possible attachment point right here. It might be right on the bar, the same bar. And then um, there might be a way to make it work. Still, right now it's, it would be tough because, I mean, I don't know if you have it mounted right there. Where are you going to attach on the loader, the quick attach thing? So, so that needs to be worked out. It's not worked out yet. Details, they're, they're important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, who's going to... So, so is Roberto still on? Roberto? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so... It looks like Roberto, Josh, and Abe are people who can do work on the design. Can you take on one of those things, one of the three? So that would be... Maybe, Abe, you, you did the tracks already. Why don't you do the... Tr unless somebody wants to take the tracks. Abe, you want to do the tracks? Yeah, I can do those again. Okay, because you know how to do them. That's going to be quick. Um, and then... Um, cab on a big tractor... Uh, uh, Roberto, do you think you can do one of these things? Maybe the cab on a big tractor? Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem on that. Um, and 
motion. I think we we were already talking about. Yep. Maybe me taking on the, the frame. So. Yep. Yeah. So that's what we got. Uh, let's do it. As soon as you guys got it, just upload it, and we can start composing the the next tractor. Just like we did this one, we can do a basic rough concept. I'd like to post that by Saturday so that we have it, like, I want to basically be updating the event announcement, like, on a weekly basis that we get more details, can keep pumping up more details. I think that's it for now. Anything else? Martian, I have a question. I yeah. sent you uh, an email about the payment. Yeah. You received that? Yeah, I think so. I, I got to take a look at that. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Who then? Um, Christian? Yeah. I, I'll, do, I'll do it quick. Um, the ISO, um, I just want to ask if there's any news on that. Actually, I'm still waiting on what, what, what about the drive problems and to try to fix it and are there oh. any other drive problems? Because I won't put out any other iter iteration as long as I don't know um, how it's working on the, on the computers. Because I think it's basically done. Okay. That's what I heard from from the testings, right? So there may be li little issues and tweaks, but uh, okay. You know. I yeah, sorry, I, I didn't get to that. I need to do that. So that's that's very important. We got we got to do it. So I'll I'll get that to you. Uh, I think. Uh, I promised that last week, but but let's uh, I think when I can shut down after this meeting, I'll boot up in the new system because I have it. Is it the is it the same one? Let's see, what's the latest one? Is it four point five or or did you go above that? What's the latest one there? Sorry, um, I think it's still four point five. So so yeah, I, I didn't do anything new because, yeah. like I said, uh, I'm still waiting on your. Um, you know, on, on, your, on your okay. Return. I got a I got a feedback on that, and we do know that we got to add start adding the path, but I don't know how to do that because there's that's in development. The path. Uh, the path. Well, Sorry? well, yeah, the path. Did you hear the comment about the path workbench, which is generating DXF cutting files, the G code cutting files from FreeCAD? That's yeah. All right, that shouldn't be any problem. It's, yeah. It's just uh, yeah, just just describe what you're doing. Uh, to install it, I'll reduce it. That, that won't be an issue. Yeah. Pretty sure it won't. Okay. Actually, the most uh, difficult thing at the moment is actually to get the wallpaper working. <laughs> oh, okay. Kind of bizarre, but it's actually the most uh, difficult thing of all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well. All right. Okay. We'll right. we'll get that feedback back to you. Uh, anything else? Do we have someone else speak up? We didn't really talk about that um, OSC wiki login. It was just text. Oh, yeah, 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 guys. For whoever's still listening to this, on the oh, the logging, logging of time, and uh, what we want to do is keep as much of that logging. Like I noticed people stopped using their logs because they, they're putting all the info into the, the timesheet. We want to use the wiki functionality for linking and, and cross-linking and all that. So please still do the hyperlinks and fire up, file uploads and everything else in your work log as normal. But just please make a summary of that in that timesheet. So the timesheet is primarily for hours and a short note on what you've done. But you don't want to be migrating all the content over into the timesheet simply because that's really duplicating the wiki database. You, no need for that. Um, and we want to use the functionality of what Lex is doing on the timesheet for like the statistics and graphing and all other kinds of uh, more like admin stuff, but not the actual content. So please um, do not stop logging your content on your log because, because yeah, it, um, that's the way it, it should be, I think, easier. Abe, that, that kind of addresses what we discussed, right? Or did I miss something? Yeah, I think that's it for now. I mean, it kind of duplicates or makes the efforts different because the OSC dev is, is nice, but if the database is kind of separate and it's not searchable right now, I, I don't know. Alex would have to 
I mean, I think we've already made the software development core pretty difficult, so I don't know if we can adapt that. Well, making it searchable is not a problem. I think what you're saying is, is to merge OAC Dev and, and the wiki. Um, actually, I, I can uh, write to the wiki. Um, well, here's the other thing. I mean, obviously this can be implemented, but uh, the amount of effort to implement it is probably greater than, than to just, you know, uh, update the wiki and, and uh, enter your hours. Like, um, the return on investment is not very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not worth spending a lot of time on. I, I was always wondering if there's a some way to do wiki extensions that would help with that, but if it takes a lot of time, then it's... Well, you know, a, a lot of time, I mean, not like a one weekend probably would be enough, because and, uh, wiki API does have a way for me to, for example, if so you would post your hours on uh, OSC Dev, and then I can do it Im immediately update your log and just insert the exact same content there. So, I mean, that's possible. Um, yeah, I was wondering if, I think the wiki, is way, I guess you have to, it's programmed with PHP and JSON for those extensions, I think. And you can customize the wiki where you could have forms in there, too. I looked at that one time, but I'm not that familiar with PHP and all that, so I, I don't know. But I guess the main thing is if you're going to rewrite data, you need to format it and put it into the database in a way that's consistent. Right. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, it's doable using the uh, Media Wiki API. So, like, you, you would put in your hours, and then at the same time, I can update your Wiki log page and, and insert the, the same content you put into OSC Dev. So that's doable, um, but it yeah. takes time to like, implement. I guess the main software that we wanted originally, I guess, was the, the graphene and, and the hour-related stuff and some of the, the graphics there. But it looked like you had a lot more software than that you're doing uh, – I didn't really understand. I looked in that uh, the other software on GitHub, but I didn't really understand a lot of that with the uh, the, oh, the applications and stuff. Uh, the yeah. forms. That that was to to make onboarding OSC devs easier. So like you know how you fill out on the wiki, you fill out the application form, and then oh you uh you sub you know you submit, and then you go through the approval process and stuff. So the idea was to fully automate that. Uh, so it would actually go as far as checking your free cat upload, making sure you actually. You know, there's something valid there and stuff like that. Yeah, and I saw the email stuff too, but uh, it looks like there's a bunch of different layers of, uh, what's it called, Django and, and different software there to interface, but, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, with that, it, the useful part is the automating the various tasks that, like, Lex is doing. Like, I don't have to generate the graph now from the Google Sheets, Google Spreadsheets. It's all automatic. So, yeah, we want to just continue on automating that as much as possible. Yeah, which is really good. It's pretty pretty good functionality to help help the workflows. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's. So it's been a long meeting. Sorry, guys. Uh, but yeah, let's let's uh, leave it at that. As, unless anything else to wrap up for today. Or do we cover the whole world now? Okay, I think we're good. So, so let's continue uh, just rocking on the tractor. I, I'm, I feel really good about it, actually. I mean, it's literally like the, you know, how, however, almost a decade of development on it. It's come a long way. Uh, it's it's getting to a point where, after this build, I mean, we're going to be very close to a releasable product that's very low cost too. Like uh, you see the numbers, forty three hundred bucks in materials right now for that small tractor with thirty two horsepower. I mean, that's a, that's a very good price compared to like a Toro Dingo, which is thirty thousand dollars. So I mean, I think there's great opportunity, and people can of course make it lower cost if they want to. Like right? with the forty three hundred dollars, that means we're getting all the parts off the shelf, like replicable. Uh, minimal sourcing issues but of course if people want to build from scratch or scrap um, they can also do that at the expense of figuring out you know how things fit together just a little more uh, but that's that's really good I feel really good about that that we can uh, hopefully start using that um, much more for just about anything here like right now I use the tractor for moving things around right now but not much more, just basically like forklift stuff and, and lugging stuff, but not much more. So we want to just make them really, really practical and usable everywhere, including hay baling, uh, pelletizing, I mean, everything. 
sawmill attachment for making lumber uh, just about anything under the sun including the the charcoal power cube and the solar autonomous tractor which we're still hoping to get we're we're actually are building the remote control module for the tractor so I mean that is actually practical if you're digging a foundation for a house that's really abusive work on a body like I did that and and I'd rather be off the tractor doing remote control on it so that my body doesn't get abused like when you really do some serious digging it's very hard on a body so just little you know improvements automation GPS uh, the autonomous tractor that can do weeding for your garden stuff like that a lot of different things that we can do here so very exciting we'll definitely do the remote control we're hoping still still uh, talk to Salam and he's still aiming to finish the the computer vision module for the tractor uh, he hasn't done that last week he's a little behind but we're hoping to get that still for this time around so we'll see if we can get that but otherwise if you know any people with automation experience or like tractor GPS Arju pilot like all these automation uh, drone stuffs uh, send them over this way because we want to do that for the tractor right now for this build okay so anyway thanks a lot guys we'll uh, continue going and uh, let's do the tractor the big one now and then we'll go back to all the refinements on that and then do some documentation on that once we get all the designs finalized so thanks a lot and we'll see you again uh, next uh, next Tuesday okay take care see you Bye-bye.